I'm Adam Lupel, IPI Vice President, and it is uh, my pleasure to welcome you to this policy forum, Reaching Internally Displaced Persons to Achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. A discussion of the trends, challenges, and concrete ways in which the plight of internally displaced persons, IDPs, can be addressed in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda. This event is in partnership with the permanent mission of Norway to the United Nations and co-sponsored by the permanent mission of Nigeria, UN OCHA, UNDP, and the Special Procedures of the Human Rights Council. Uh, I wish to thank all our partners, and in particular, our partners at the Norwegian Mission for this event and uh, for their continued support to IPI. Today's event is, of course, happening on the sidelines of the 2018 UN High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, uh, an unavoidable fact of the neighborhood. Uh, we were just remembering nostalgically for when July was a quiet month around the uh, UN. No more. But it's for good reason. The HLPF has a central role in the follow-up and review of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, at the global level. This event also forms part of both IPI's dedicated program on humanitarian affairs and its program on the SDGs. It provides a great opportunity for us to make the connection between the need to address the particular needs of IDPs, which is more often framed in terms of a humanitarian issue, and uh, member states' commitments to implement the SDGs and indeed to leave no one behind. If we are going to deliver on the pledge to leave no one behind, we cannot neglect the plight of IDPs. The number of people displaced in their own countries is nearly double the global refugee population. And these IDPs are among the most vulnerable in the world. As, the displacement, uh, as displacement endures, development challenges arise alongside humanitarian concerns, and this is evident in many current contexts. Despite the huge and growing scale of internal displacement, though, we have to uh, admit that forward momentum on addressing this issue has waned in recent years. However, this year marks the 20th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement, which is the only global framework relating to the rights, protection, and assistance of IDPs. And so this presents us a strategic opportunity to reflect on how much more needs to be done and to foster a multi-year action aimed at the protection, prevention, and solutions for IDPs. The UN's 2030 Agenda specifically mentions IDPs as a vulnerable group who must be empowered through efforts to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. It supports national level action to prevent arbitrary displacement, enhance protection, and facilitate durable solutions for IDPs. Given the number of people displaced today, as we say, progress toward the SDGs will not be achieved if these people are not reached. So this event uh, in um, it's called the sharing spirit of the HLPF, will allow us to discuss the link between development policies and internal displacement by sharing some tangible examples of actions that governments, civil society, and the international community are taking to help implement uh, the SDGs by including IDPs. And we have a great distinguished panel to discuss all of this but before I introduce them from uh, the panel, I'd like to uh, give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. May Ellen Stenner, Deputy Permanent Representative of Norway to the United Nations for some opening remarks. Ambassador, welcome back to IPI. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and Adam, you already mentioned who, who we are organizing this, uh, this event. Uh, so uh, I can say only that uh, 
Uh, I am, and Norway is, very happy to be part of this and part of, uh, part of uh, this event. And, uh, and I'm also personally very happy to, to have the honor to, uh, to do the opening uh, remarks. This is uh, such an important uh, issue uh, to, to, uh, to de discuss, the issue of the internally displaced persons. It is of growing importance. In 2016, there were 40 million uh, internally displaced because of conflict. And in addition to that, 24 million people were displaced due to sudden onset natural disasters. Their plight has unfortunately taken a back seat in the policy debates that we have uh, today, where refugees and migration fl flows raise concerns for a multitude of actors from member states and the UN, to international human rights advocates and humanitarian organizations alike. Internal dis Placement due to complex crisis, climate change, and sudden onset natural disaster pose huge challenges to international peace and security. Uh, also, which is what we are going to discuss uh, today, if we are to take the slogan of the uh, Sustainable Development Goals seriously, uh, which is leave no one behind, of course, we also um, have to be concerned about IDPs. Uh, for Norway, IDPs has been a priority um, for a while. We have been the co-sponsor of the IDP resolu resolution in the General Assembly. Uh, the protection of IDPs has been on the agenda of my government for many years, and we are working closely um, with the, the NGO uh, Norwegian Refugee Council in this regard. This year, uh, focusing on, on IDPs is of particular importance uh, for five reasons. Firstly, uh, 2018 is the 20th anniversary of the guiding principles for uh, IDPs. Secondly, the IDP resolution in the General Assembly last year made a particular call for renewed focus and efforts on the plight of the IDPs. Thirdly, IDPs were left out of global compacts uh, on migration and global compact on refugees. Uh, but the New York Declaration reminds us of the need to find more effective strategies for IDPs. Also number four, we have seen inclusion of IDPs in a number of broader policies uh, and frameworks, for example, the new urban agenda. And fifth uh, point is that there is a need to do more. <laughs> and indeed, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development provides an opportunity and a platform to bring IDPs to the foreground. It specifically mentioned IDPs as a vulnerable group who must be empowered through efforts to achieve the SDGs. Given the number of people displaced today, progress towards the SDGs will not be achieved if these people are not reached. I'm looking forward to hearing uh, the rest of the panel uh, today. I hope that they can shed some light on uh, the link between IDPs and development issues, the current trends and challenges in in incorporating IDPs in development planning, and I hope uh, that uh, we will see some concrete examples of how states have worked to include IDPs in their efforts to implement the SDGs. Uh, I look very much forward uh, to also exploring how humanitarian concerns tie in with development concerns, and what opportunities there are to advance the rights and, and status of IDPs and to support affected member states around the world. It's our conviction uh, that member states can achieve the SDGs while improving the life of the most vulnerable also. Thank you so much and look forward. Uh, thank you.
Thank you for these remarks, Ambassador, and thank you uh, both personally and to your, to your mission and to your government, Norway, for your uh, commitment and leadership on these issues. It's uh, indispensable. Uh, so we'll now turn to, to the panel. Um, I'll give a brief introduction. You do have uh, speakers' bios in your handouts. Um, the order that we're going to go to is a little bit different than we have up here on the, on the stage and on the program. Uh, we'd like first uh, to turn to Ms. Uh, Cecilia Jimenez de Mari. United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of Internally Displaced Persons. Um, Ms. Jimenez Damari is a human rights lawyer specialized in forced displacement and migration and was appointed by the Human Rights Council in 2016. She has previously worked as the National Director of the IDP Project of the Commission on Human Rights of the Philippines and with IDMC, the International Displacement Monitoring Center of the Norwegian Refugee Council. We'll then turn to Her Excellency, Princess Victoria Adejoke Arelope Adefalure. What did I do there? Okay. Senior Special Advisor to the President of Nigeria on the SDGs. Her Excellency has a long-standing political career in Nigeria, serving as a member of the Lagos State House of uh, Assembly, being appointed to the Lagos State as uh, the Lagos State Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, for Women Affairs and Poverty Alleviation, and then elected as Deputy Governor of Lagos State. She was appointed Senior Special Assistant to the President on SDGs in 2015. Hans-Jörg Strohmeyer is the Chief of OCHA's Policy Development and Studies Branch. Mr. Strohmeyer, no stranger to this stage has over 20 years of experience with the UN, having served as Chief of Staff to OCHA's Emergency Response Coordinator, overseeing the Interagency Standing Committee Secretariat, and serving in senior positions in several UN political and peacekeeping missions, including Lebanon, Sudan, Kosovo, East Timor, and Liberia. And finally, Mr. Bruno Le Marquis, Director AI of the Crisis Response Unit at UNDP, Mr. Le Marquis has been working for UNDP for over 20 years, serving in headquarters and in countries such as Cambodia, the occupied Palestinian territories, Haiti, and Somalia, and most recently has held senior positions within UNDP's Bureau for Crisis Prevention and Recovery. Uh, a very distinguished panel with a lot of expertise and experience. Uh, we should have a very um, vibrant discussion. Every, uh, the panelists will speak for about 10 minutes each, and then we should have plenty of time uh, for Q&A. And with that, I will turn to uh, Cecilia. Cecilia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Adam. And thank you very much to everybody for being here. I would like to give my appreciation to the International Peace Institute and as well the government of Norway for organizing this very special and uh, important um, uh, discussion. And of course, Ocha as well, for also for being here in UNDP and Nigeria. My mandate has been very much involved in advocating for the inclusion of internally displaced persons in the Sustainable Development Goals with very close partners since 2014. And in fact, my predecessor, Professor Chaloka Biani, dedicated one of his thematic reports to the General Assembly on this particular topic. So I will focus my intervention on the importance to include a dedicated focus on IDPs in the SDG implementation and on the tools at our disposal to ensure that SDGs do not bypass them, as the ambassador from Norway, Norway had, uh, had stated. As reflected in the guiding principles on internal displacement, governments have the primar primary responsibility to prevent internal displacement, protect IDPs, and assist those IDPs to support them for durable solutions. And this would be through the voluntary, safe, and dignified return, local integration, or settlement elsewhere in the country. Ultimately, durable solutions free internally displaced persons from a cycle of dependency on humanitarian aid and we have a lot of them right now, enabling them equal access to basic services as well as livelihoods and education to develop self-reliance as well as resilience and ultimately to rebuild their lives. Now, why is the 2030 agenda highly relevant to the realization of durable solutions for IDPs? 
let me focus on four particular sub, five particular subtopics. The first one is poverty and food insecurity. And this is addressed by SDGs number one and two. These are commonly a, a result of displacement as IDPs are deprived of land, livelihoods, and for indigenous peoples, even their ancestral domains. Second, healthcare and education. These are the subjects of goals three and four. And obviously, in many, many of the cases of IDP, some of whom are in protracted displacement for an average of 17 years since their first displacement, these are not accessible to the IDPs or are insufficient to meet their needs. Third is employment and decent work. And of course, IDPs often require assistance with access to employment and decent work, as in goal eight. They are regularly discriminated against socially, economically, and politically, and face the persistent inequality that SDG 10 aims to reduce. Number four, more and more <coughs> IDPs are now res re residing in urban areas that require development under goal 11, and more and more people are being displaced internally by the adverse effects of climate change, as in goal 13. And last but not least, this year, 40 million people remain internally displaced by conflict and violence. And SDG 16, which promotes peaceful and inclusive societies, works towards reducing these root causes and facilitating safe return and reintegration. If measures meant to lift the country out of poverty bypass IDPs, in effect, the SDGs will not be met in many countries. Over the last year, I undertook official missions to El Salvador, Libya, and Niger, which represent very different situations in terms of causes of displacement, current security and living conditions of IDPs, and, governments, and government response. But IDPs also face a common a common um, uh, discussion, common situation, which are the loss of social protection networks, exposure to risks, abuses, such as early marriage, gender-based violence, intercommunal tensions and evictions. Second, the deprivation of traditional livelihoods and critical need for income-generating activities. Third, national responses, unfortunately, focus on the short-term security and policy measures with few initiatives on economic and inclusive development, which SDGs are meant to provide. In order to ensure that IDPs will benefit from SDGs, governments, with the support of national and international partners as well, must adopt specific measures simply hoping that general anti-poverty measures will benefit IDPs will not work without a dedicated focus. What could some, some such measures entail? First of all, I think it will be very important to ensure that national legal and policy framework is conducive to solutions and does not, for example, include measures preventing IDPs to recover their poverty after many number of years. Also developing national strategies for durable solutions and including IDPs in national development plans is a must. We need to improve data collection and analysis on internal displacement to strengthen national ownership and enhance their impact for development outcomes. And last but not the least, we must devise mechanisms to ensure the meaningful participation of internally displaced persons in decisions affecting them. My latest report actually to the General Assembly last year was on this topic by giving IDPs ownership of their problems and their solutions, the and agencies over their solutions, governments and organizations can ensure that IDPs have the freedom to be active in seeking recovery with dignity, and as well, when participation is encouraged and sought out, IDPs can even communicate their capacities and potentials for recovery. This will help humanitarian and development actors to design, implement, and monitor solutions that are adoptive, responsive, effective, and sustainable. 
All these measures are also the focus of an initiative I spearheaded with, UN High Com with the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, with OCHA, and also partners like UNDP and other states um, for the 20th anniversary of the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement, which Ambassador Stenner had mentioned. And many states support this. The GP20 Plan of Action, which is now actually being um, spearheaded by Austria, Honduras, and Uganda, with many of the agencies, plan to focus on national level action, including to ensure that IDPs benefit from the SDGs. So the focus is really on national plan on, on the national level. And I really invite everybody to look into this guide to the, to the GP20, we call it, plan of action, which we summarize with three buzzwords, prevent, protect, and resolve. As a special rapporteur, I also dialogue with governments and partners to support them to respond more effectively to internal displacement in line with their international obligations. A primary tool I use is the IASC framework on durable solutions for IDPs, which is based on the guiding principles on internal displacement and which provides eight very simple criteria that actually coincide with many of the SDG goals that we have in front of us. Moreover, the joint IDP profiling service, which many agencies as well um, support with humanitarian and development partners, have uh, undertaken the Durable Solutions Indicators Library, which is a key tool, openly accessible online, for governments and stakeholders to analyze displacement situations in their own country. This resource has actually resulted from a multi-year process, including pilot exercises in Sudan, Colombia, Myanmar, and Somalia. It is particularly useful for helping to shape data processes that can enable the inclusion of IDPs in plans to achieve the SDGs. My team has also been very much involved in um, a significant data initiative in this regard the expert group on refugees and IDP statistics, which of course Norway is very much uh, involved in. Mandated by the UN Statistical Commission, this process is developing international recommendation for IDP statistics to improve quality, compat comparability, and connectivity to national system. It is my hope, ladies and gentlemen, that by making use of these tools at our disposal, and these are amongst many, states and their partners can develop coordinated responses to internal displacement, successfully implementing the SDGs, and empowering IDPs to regain their self-reliance and livelihoods. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. I think that, that, that uh really puts us on a great start of making the connection between IDPs and SDGs. Uh, you, you know, poverty and food insecurity, healthcare and education, employment and decent work, the issue of cities, which I think is, is really important. We're gonna be doing some further work on that here at IPI, um, and of course, conflict prevention. And I think I also take very um, specifically your point that there needs to be a, a dedicated focus on IDPs. It can't just be something to say we need to include them in a general terms. There has to be specific measures in place and you give some great examples. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll now turn um, to uh, Her Excellency Arajoke Arulope. Um, Arajiliji? Fuluri. Um, and you could uh, share some national perspectives and examples from Nigeria for us. The floor is yours. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the chairman, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you this afternoon to share uh, experience of Nigeria on the, the development of um, the IDPs and uh, towards the achieving SDGs come 2030. Let me thank the International Peace Institute for inviting us and to be part of this very important meeting uh, to be able to achieve the slogan of SDG, which is leaving no one behind. And then leaving no one behind, it is important to emphasize the need to rally around to support 
the people uh, often, especially the children, often by insurgency through ND, uh, in the IDPs, um, give me pleasure to be here to participate at this very event to share Nigeria experience on our activities and interventions to ensure that internally displaced persons are adequately catered for on a regular basis while planning on a long-term sustainable resettlement and prevention of the occurrence of insurgency in the northeast of Nigeria, another part of the country. Uh, following the conflict and insurgency in the northeast region of Nigeria in 2009, and at the climax of insurgency in 2014, um, ensuring through humanitarian crisis, the Presidential Committee on Northeast Initiative was inaugurated by the President of Nigeria through executive order in 2016 to serve as primary national strategy coordination and advisory body for all humanitarian interventions, transformational and development efforts in that particular region. It will interest you to know that we have six states affected by insurgency. It is our belief that the national government will have adopted the right mix of mechanism and invest in the system because disaster mostly affects the urban poor. Since its inception of the committee, they have worked in collaboration with the national government, the six state governors, in the Northeast, the UNTB, UNDP and UN system, as well as ministry, department, and agency of government, are the national and sub-national government, the civil society organization, another development partner, the private sector, and all to coordinate all humanitarian intervention efforts in the Northeast of Nigeria. As a result of this committee intervention, with development and financial institution with the World Bank, Africa Development Bank, as well as Islamic Bank, has rallied around and they have committed over $760 million towards rebuilding the Northeast, Eastern part of Nigeria. This fund uh, is a month for projects across education, agriculture, healthcare social cohesion and infrastructural development. What we mean that we have rebuilding the schools that have been burnt down during the insurgency, the hospital has been rebuilt. We are building also ho homes for those people that lost their homes. And they, of course, they will have a large number of children orphaned by insurgency, which we are, we, uh, we are two projects were initiated to foster the children family to foster them, and as well as making sure that they have a good education. The government, through the uh, office of the vice president, has just concluded phase one of the 1,000 young children uh, housed and schooled in a particular place. And the second phase is ongoing for another 1,000 another thousand children. It is our belief that all the children orphaned will be properly educated to be a fighter against insurgency in future. For us to do that, we are trying to ensure that the trauma gets out of the children because not only that we educate them, we counsel them, and that's why the fostering is very important to make them develop within the family. And more people are coming up now in Nigeria to foster the children. Again, to ensure accountability and transparency, the use of multilateral development Bank committee, the committee in partnership with the office of the vice president again has set up independent program management and coordination cell called Northeast Recovery and Stability Program to be able to ensure that what to prioritize the need of those people. So they must go back to where they came from. We must ensure that they have any living, and they must. As we are rebuilding their home, we want to introduce those that are interested in farming. The government is introducing mechanized farming for them and giving them loan with a long-time moratorium 
to settle them down. And we are providing life skill development program also for them to learn a skill that will support them, especially for women also to learn a skill and to start a trade to be able to support the family. And the children are also having school free and qualitative education up to university level by uh, 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 um, initiative of the government of Nigeria. And uh, of course, through the education, we just have uh, the intervention we have made about 1,456 young people, especially those that are orphaned, have started their school and where the 43 schools, new schools have been built and 1,200 primary school and secondary school teachers were trained to impact on 60,000 young people, especially in Borono, Adamawa, Yobe, and um, Borono State. And over 1.1 billion has been spent on reconstruction of guest government secondary school, Ishibok. You know, the, the story started from Ishibok. The Ishibok story, the school has been rebuilt. All the schools in Ishibok that has burned down has been rebuilt for the guests. And the adequate security has been put in place. Uh, but uh, the, the immigration has their uh, uh, border there. The police has their station there. Uh, in fact, the, the, the president has, has asked that the service should move their uh, operational activities to that particular place because it's difficult for us now to move those community out because that's where they live for many years. So what we need to do is to strengthen the security apparatus around the area to protect them from being harassed and being molested. On healthcare program, we have uh, about two, 350,000 people, including women and children, have, been, have benefited from intervention, from provision of regular medical activities, and the young people also. We, we have the hospital built, and free healthcare system has been put in place for them, for them to be able to settle down formally, start businesses that they are, before they start paying for services. For now, services is free for all of them, both men, women, young people, and the uh, more uh, service provider has been trained to, to support them within their territory. Also, we have also provided a sum of 2.5 billion naira to over 225,000 households in 40 local governments across the region for the factory of the victims to set up businesses to for a, a small scale loan, like I, I earlier said, to start their businesses. And a lot of uh, long time moratorium has been provided. You are not paying, the, pay, the payment is not automatic. It's not it's a lot of uh, two years moratorium for you to settle down, do the business. If you are not comfortable with the business, you come back to the uh, service provider and then you can now be trained in another skill that can guarantee your survival and business opportunity. We also promote uh, job opportunity, employment creation to ensure and to ensure food security. I mentioned also that 400 million has been uh, set aside for the promotion of agriculture. Within that community, farming is very popular and the government is buying tractors, um, farm, farm implement to support the uh, the farmers who are willing to go back to their farms, not only to go back to their farms and to show that their farms are well protected against uh, attack. You recall that recently we have an issue of uh, herdsmen and the farmers. So for that particular uh, um, side of the country, we ensure that surveillance are being provided to ensure that people go to their farm do their farming activities without being harassed or being attacked. Also, we have uh, we train young people uh, in ICT related uh, skills to for them to develop innovation and to come up with uh, ideas on how best the government can assist them. Uh, also, that one is also ongoing, and uh, also we try to ensure that those people that came from Cameroon, 
that are part of the uh, insurgents because we share boundary with Cameroon. They are also being supported also to those that are ready to go back to Cameroon are also being assisted. Some that are ready to stay in Nigeria are also being uh, assisted. So I think that um, it's uh, very, very important to, to say that the, the media organization are also trained on conflict sensitive communication strategy. And uh, that is ongoing on how we can communicate and can, as part of the uh, counseling program that the government has introduced to them, if these young people get to know those that are there when their parents are being killed, are separated from those that heard about the insurgency, the trauma between the two are, is very different. So those that are there are very, they were moved out of that community for proper counseling. And those are the people that we are giving out for fostering to live with the family. And we are happy that more people are taking them to live with them so that the trauma can get out of them. Right. Those people that heard about is how you communicate to people what is urgency is. So we need to train our, our um, a media organization how to report that, especially in that community, so that they don't create bad impression. And so that those people that were rescued are not becoming uh, terrorists in the future or being uh, to attack people in the future. So there, is a, there must be a sort of um, a way in which the reporting system will be passed to the community, especially the young people who are still very sensitive in, 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 in uh, terrorism, knowing the, what the effect of terrorism in their lives. And I think that um, intervention will continue. This intervention will continue. We have resettled about 4,000 families now. And the, interestingly, the wife of the president is also mobilizing the, um, the non-governmental organization and civil society organization to support her to, to settle the family down and ensure that they live a normal life. We, the, the, the intervention will continue as much as we have the IDPs and we are ready to work with all the stakeholders and ensure that we continue and uh, make sure that uh, the issue of social economy inequality, social exclusion, extreme poverty, and high rate of uh, unemployment is a thing of the past. And uh, we will continue to ensure that we take care of the people in IDPs so that we don't leave anyone behind. Goal 11 is very important, and goal 16, which is with uh, peace, justice, and strong decision is very key in ensuring that the people in IDPs are well protected and prevented from further attack. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Your Excellency, for um, sharing some of those concrete examples about how, how Nigeria is, is looking to address IDPs while also planning for long-term sustainable development. I think this is um, really what this week is all about, the HLPF sharing nationally driven uh, stories and policies to help uh, build uh, international support and also to help other countries learn from your experiences. So I really, uh, really appreciate that. Uh, we'll now uh, turn to uh, Hans Jörg. Hans Jörg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much also to IPI and, and uh, very much also to Norway. Um, Norway has been for a long time one of the most steadfast supporters of uh, IDPs and uh, that's what we certainly need at this uh, time. Um, I just wanted to look at the, the figure that is frequently mentioned but that no one has mentioned so far, which <laughs> is that um, we have uh, way over 40 million um, uh, IDPs, which is around two-thirds of the displacement uh, challenge. So it's, um, I'm not saying more important, but it's, it's clear that it's uh, equally important to any of the other forms of uh, displacement. But if you look at that number of 40 million um, conflict uh, displaced, most of them, the vast majority of them, are actually protracted for many, many years. And whether the figure is absolutely incorrect, uh, absolutely correct or not, uh, um, is is irrelevant. But there was this figure of 17 years on on average. So for many many 
IDPs, once they enter displacement, and it's multiple displacement, it's a life sentence. It continues for the rest of their life. So what really is behind those 40 million is not a humanitarian short-term um, need. It's a very, very long-term developmental and political need. And, and just to, to frame the conversation, and that's why it is very much an SDG uh, conversation. And we did, in the run-up to the, to the SDGs, we pushed very hard um, and, in the end, got some, in the political declaration, some recognition of uh, internal displacement. But there is no target on IDPs, and there are very, very few indicators um, on, on IDPs. And in my view, that remains a weakness um, uh, of, the, of the framework. Because if you look at some of those situations, out of those 40 million, now I don't want to put any wrong figures, but let's say 37 million or so are probably protracted long-term displacement. How can you imagine that in some countries, I believe the figures in Colombia are around 7 million IDPs, how can you believe that in a country that has 7 million IDPs, there will be sustainable development without uh, sustainable development for those IDPs? There will be no solutions for um, uh, on sustainable development without uh, looking at, uh, at IDPs. Um, and that's why uh, during the World Humanitarian Summit, so the next opportunity after the SDG adoption, um, it's the humanitarians who very much pushed um, to, to change the paradigm a little bit, to, to get out of this uh, perception that IDPs are a humanitarian caseload. Well, it is because in many situations it's been parked at the doorsteps of the, of the humanitarian community and left there. And humanitarians have been inundated. I mean, I just have with, with um, cost and uh, capacity shortages. Let me give you a few examples. 19 out of the 20 humanitarian response plans that revolve around IDP responses have had a duration for five years and longer. In three situations, DRC, Somalia, and Sudan, we've had for 18 years running humanitarian response plans for including for, for IDPs. Those are the realities. Um, solutions, however, are something very different. And that's the second point that I wanted to, to, to make. Solutions require us to recognize that there is a humanitarian uh, contribution, and there is a humanitarian um, uh, aspect to this, but the real focus, in addition to political solutions, must be on development. And it's not the fault of our development colleagues, it's partly, of course, the obstacles that are provided by, by governments, but it's also the way we plan, the way we fund. There is more that we can do. And if at the center of the SDGs, in addition to the big um, boilerplate, uh, um, uh, leave no one behind and so on, but the ambition of the SDGs is to reduce risk, need, and vulnerability. So for the humanitarian community, which has been working for many years um, to meet the needs, which is to meet the status quo, status quo is not enough. You need to reduce the vulnerability of these people. You need to reduce their need. That's at the core of the SDGs. And that's exactly what is necessary um, to, uh, to move IDPs, particularly those protracted IDPs, out of their misery. And as the former Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees once called it, many of us are in the business of perpetuating human misery by just providing humanitarian assistance for 15, 20 years running to the same or a growing group of people uh, in, in very many instances in camp settings or absorbed um, in, uh, in major urban settings. So, key message, IDPs is not primarily a humanitarian issue. It is um, a developmental um, issue um, and a political issue. Um, and that's why on the solutions side, what re is required to, to achieve that aim of, of reducing um, their need and vulnerability is a number of things. First of all, it requires different types of interventions. Um, so we need to look much more at markets, creating markets and market solutions for, for IDPs. They need to become productive 
members of their environment, their society. IDPs means they're still citizens of their own country. They're in their own country. Um, job creation, uh, make them productive parts of society. Housing and land issues. I mentioned Colombia uh, um, earlier on. It's very, very clear that that is one of the most critical issues. And there have been good um, instances and good projects in the past where um, UNDP and UNHCR and, and others work together, transitional initiatives, to actually focus on, uh, on legalizing uh, IDPs in a specific uh, um, uh, situation. And so what you saw is very quickly they move into different uh, stages, not only of being, but also uh, productivity. Uh, they all of a sudden, because of that legal tenor, uh, uh, they're uh, able uh, to uh, have uh, water supplies uh, to, collect, uh, to connect to electricity. So they don't need that anymore to be provided for by humanitarian organizations. Um, so that's the focus uh, for protracted uh, displacement. And it is possible, even in situations where the political final solution hasn't uh, been found yet. A second point is, and that goes to a study that um, we commissioned following the World Humanitarian Summit um, to, to look at that imperative that we had put up. It is part at the humanitarian doorsteps. We have a contribution, but ultimately it is a developmental um, issue. We need to work in the spirit of the new way of working that the Sector General has promoted to collective outcomes. We need to recognize that IDP response is not an annual response, it's a long-term response. It needs three to five-year plans, and uh, solutions can only be, uh, be achieved over five-year um, uh, windows. And that's where Walter Kerlin, one of our most esteemed uh, uh, colleagues um, and very instrumental uh, in drafting the uh, um, uh, guiding principles, um, basically did a study called Breaking the Impasse, which suggests um, how to take forward, how to articulate um, a goal of reducing uh, the number of IDPs, or at least their vulnerability and their need, um, over five years um, in, in our plan. So it's also our planning, the way we plan, um, that, uh, that, that is important. And thirdly, I'm very grateful for the uh, example that was already given by uh, our colleague from Nigeria, it is country and government leadership. Um, it will not happen without that. You need to integrate IDPs consistently into your national development plans. You need to include them in your budgets. And very often, it's not only the national budgets. It's regional and local budgets. IDP um, uh, accumulations are a local phenomenon. They totally overwhelm local communities, even to the detriment of the original population, the non-displaced population. Um, so you need to look at the budget structure of a, of a country. It, needs to, uh, uh, it requires dedicated institutions and authorities uh, in, in countries and legal and political measures. I mentioned the, 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 the legal uh, tenure to, to, to land and everything. But at a much more simple level, it's also freedom of movement. If you want people to have moved to more secure housing solutions, some of the things that uh, uh, our colleague from Nigeria pointed out, they require um, a freedom of movement that these uh, people live, which in many places they don't um, uh, have to connect with, uh, with jobs. So in terms of um, next steps, uh, my, my last uh, point is, I think uh, the new way of working, working two collective outcomes over multiple years, humanitarian and development actors together, um, uh, is the way to go. The Secretary General uh, identified the Sahel, the Lake Chad Basin, uh, and the Horn of Africa, in addition to DRC and Afghanistan, all of which have displacement situations um, as our focus area. That's where we need to make it happen. Um, we are rolling out this uh, study that we did with Walter Kellen, breaking the impasse, to actually help country teams um, articulate those collective outcomes around IDP responses to get a reductionist um, mentality also into our planning, meaning re re looking at interventions that reduce the vulnerability rather than continue to give them over 15 years, 20 years, the same thing. Thirdly, um, uh, resident coordinators and governments uh, need to really make sure that IDPs are much more regular, displacement more generally, included in SDG roadmaps and, and national development uh, uh, plans. Um, fourthly, uh, we are working with our colleagues from UNHCR on the CRRF to make sure that we don't forget, for many years we've said, 
today's IDP is tomorrow's refugee, but we also have the reverse. In many situations, today's refugee is tomorrow's IDP. And quite frankly, what we're seeing is that situation is far worse than the, 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 the previous one. And so it is important that we don't just look at a refugee response disconnected from what is happening potentially in neighboring countries. And my last point is, um, in order to promote the, the IDP response, there are various uh, thoughts at a senior level. We don't want to add our um, high-level conference to this, but there are ideas around panels and others um, to give more vid visibility to IDPs. And we certainly, from the OCHA side, very much support that. Thank you very much. Great, Hans uh, A lot there, very, very clear and concrete. I mean, it, essentially, the need to move beyond this perception that IDPs are, are solely a humanitarian caseload um, and that solutions, there's, you know, there is a humanitarian element, there's a political element, but development is a fundamental uh, part of it. In this room, we talk a lot about uh, the need to make connections across the UN silos, and I think this, this example is, 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 uh, is predominant there, and of course the SDGs provide the great perfect frame in order to, to accomplish that. Um, and also, I, I take your point about planning, I think it's back to Cecilia's point, that we, we, we understand this now, but it can't just be something that we recognize, we actually need to plan for it, put it into the roadmaps, encourage uh, governments to, and, and our C's to have those uh, specific um, policies in place, um, so much appreciated there. Uh, Bruno, the floor is yours. Thank you. And we won the World Cup. <laughs> okay, we are not too much into soccer. Okay, so I want to add my thanks to uh, IPI and government of Norway for organizing this event. I've been asked to say a few words on explaining the work uh, uh, a development organization such as UNDP is playing in the context of, uh, of uh, uh, displacement and, and the SDGs in particular how to ensure that this is picked up by uh, national planning processes. Yeah. Um, so, as has been said already, displacement is a complex humanitarian and, and uh, development challenge happening in given political and, and security context. And central to the 2030 agenda is, is the commitment to leave no one behind, and many of the ones left behind are, are the displaced, including internally displaced. Yeah. The major causes of protracted displacement, uh, among others, include the lack of political solutions, the lack of political will, and often a limited engagement by in international actors beyond the humanitarian caseload management to move to move uh, to, to longer term to address those issues with a longer term perspective. So as has been said uh, uh, by colleagues, especially Ocha, addressing uh, displacement, including internal displacement, cannot be purely a humanitarian concern. In fact, the traditional approach the, where IDP response is largely left to uh, humanitarian actors, in spite of all the goodwill, cannot bring solution because this, the humanitarian action is not about bringing solutions. Uh, so the SDGs underscore the need for development action and much more development investment in preventing and resolving protracted displacement. None of that is new. It's not a new discussion. It's an old discussion. But there are a few things that, that can bring some... some uh, some lights and some hope into that discussion. Yeah. Um, first is all the momentum currently around prevention. Yeah. The best way not to have protracted displacement, not to have displacement at all, is the prevention agenda. Yeah. So that you don't have a crisis in the first place, so that you don't have displacement in the first place, be it in a conflict setting, yeah, in conflict, or even in, in disaster setting, yeah, because all, there are also a lot of displaced due to, to uh, in disaster context. We often say natural disaster. The disasters are not natural. What is natural is the, the, the climatic event. Yeah. The disasters only happen because prevention, where there has not been sufficient investment in prevention and mitigation and, and, and uh, to, 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 uh, to avoid uh, consequences. Yeah. So all of that is about investing massively in prevention. Uh, and that's, that's very high on the discourse, in particular in the UN currently. Yeah. But the second momentum, the second shift has been what Hans Jörg has said around the, this realization that we are on it together in a very context-specific manner, but we are on it together. The humanitarian, the development, and where, where needed, the peace-building actors. Yeah. So we need to work much more collectively, much more joined up, uh, working around collective outcomes, as has been, uh, as has been explained, to collectively 
reduce risk, vulnerabilities and needs, and not only put up the fire, put up the fire, put up the fire. So that's, that's the only way to tackle some of the, the root causes and the longer term vulnerabilities. Yeah. So as the new way of working, it's important that the thinking and discussion shift from this is what the humanitarian are doing and this is what the development when they come up are doing. It's about join up. And this has major consequences across all our ecosystem and silos on the way we analyze, on the way we agree, on the, on the, on the root causes, the way we plan, the way we program, uh, the way we finance, including international donors, the way we finance so that we support this collective endeavor. Uh, a few words on, on, on UNDP. We have prioritized the issue of displacement in our strategic plan. Uh, we work on displacement issues Sometimes we don't call them displacement issue, but in about 30 countries. And we apply a development approach to force displacement using a resilience lens. Yeah. So we do that uh, by doing four things. We support government with national and local strategy, policy, and institutional development. For example, if, uh, looking at the inclusion of displaced people in SDG localization, uh, planning processes, budgeting processes, and service delivery. We work on addressing, with many others, the root causes of forced displacement, be it governance challenges, inequalities, and so on. We support IDPs and host community to cope and recover from shocks. Uh, so this can be through uh, livelihood, economic recovery, governance work, and so on, social cohesion. And when possible and where possible, we support the voluntary, dignified, and sustainable return uh, of, uh, of the displaced. Yeah. So let me give you four quick examples, and so many, many others have been uh, mentioned already, uh, uh, all of them stressing the critical importance of, of national ownership. The first one is, is in, uh, in Iraq, where UNDP has worked with a, a very strong leadership of government of Iraq and a broad coalition of actors uh, to prioritize their response through a, a massive, significant stabilization effort, which had a massive impact on the internally displaced population. Yeah. So that might be a, a little different from what has been mentioned so far, but this, this stabilization has allowed those protracted displacement not to be too protracted, because there has been so much attention given to the quick stabilization in the so-called liberated areas that this has created a pool factor for return. And so far, 2.2 million Iraqis have returned to their homes out of 5.4 internally displaced. Yeah. Um, so, but again, there was massive attention because it's Iraq, and massive investment because it's Iraq. Yeah. Um, the second one is Ukraine. So Ukraine, I will mention, uh, sorry to be boring, a bureaucratic process, but it's a very important process in this context. It's called the MAPS. The MAPS, for those who don't know, is, is, uh, is the methodology that has been uh, endorsed by the UN Sustainable Development Group uh, in supporting the rollout and the, the accelerated implementation of the SDGs. Yeah. So MAPS means Mainstreaming Acceleration and Policy Support. Uh, and it, uh, it's an interagency process, and it, it helps government to land and contextualize the 2030 agenda at national and local level ultimately reflecting the ESDG agenda in, in national plans, strategies, and budgets. So those missions are very important because you have real discussion with national government on how to land uh, the ESDGs at, uh, at national level. Yeah. So the MAPS mission that, that went to, uh, to Ukraine, first noting that in Ukraine, as a result of the new way of working discussion, there has been a, a very good alignment of the plan, the humanitarian and the development plans. So the MAPS mission is as recommended, they just went there, they, they have recommended five things with uh, direct respect to IDPs. Yeah. Um, the first one, reforms and decision-making processes need to be better coordinated and should include the most vulnerable. The second one, policies that reduce IDP vulnerabilities, minimize discrimination against them, and support local integration needs to be supported. The third one, a dealing king of IDP registration from access to pensions and social benefits. The fourth one, an adoption of a housing strategy enabling municipalities to allocate affordable housing to IDPs. And the fifth one, investment in initiative promoting social cohesion between IDPs and, social, and the host community. 
So that's the type of recommendation that are really targeting uh, the displaced. Yeah. So the discussion is ongoing. It needs to be adopted. It needs to be and so on. But that's that's a that's a way of having a mainstreaming discussion uh, with with particular attention to the to the displaced. Yeah. Um, third example in, is Somalia, which has been mentioned already, which where the the durable solution for displaced people is a key priority and is now reflected in the Somali National Development Plan. For those who have followed Somalia, this is quite this is quite something. Yeah? It's quite uh, uh, groundbreaking. Uh, and and this plan is a framework that cuts across humanitarian and development divide and support the homegrown durable solution initiative. So in Somalia, there is also a lot, a lot going on around, around that. And then the last example, sorry to be long, it is in, in Sudan. Sudan is complicated. We had two MAPS mission that recently went to, to Sudan to have those discussion with, the, with the, the, all the, the actors and, and the government. So uh, interagency mission plus OECD. Uh, and so they discussed with the government the, the, uh, the particular issue of the IDPs, and the government requested that uh, the inclusion of the need of 2.5 million IDPs in future work on SDG assessment and costing, which is, which is a, a, a good message. So the discussion right now with the government is about amending, revising the National Development Plan for Sudan, and those conversations are ongoing. Uh, to to reflect more precisely on the need of the of the displaced and not not having them just considered as part of the poor and as part of uh, humanitarian activity targets but to to have specific focus on uh, on them yeah? and this revised program where we hope the needs of the IDP will be specifically reflected is uh, expected to go to the council of ministers for approval at the end of the year so these are example of beyond activities, you also need to engage in terms of, of uh, national planning, budgeting, costing, and, and all of that. Yeah. And this is very much in line with the, the, the OCHA study breaking the impasse that very much call for government to define, integrate, and prioritize collective outcome that address protracted internal displacement within national development plan. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great, thank you for uh, for more really uh, concrete examples of how this uh, this agenda is moving forward, um, and also for your your emphasis on the prevention agenda. That as you say, it's not about just putting out fires, putting out fires, but uh, long term solutions. I think it's incredible. I think we've got um, quite a bit of coherence on the on this panel. I almost feel like we're we're exemplifying the new way of working here ourselves when the humanitarian development, human rights, and uh, and national government efforts working together. Uh, for collective outcomes. Um, sometimes I think in the field it's not quite as harmonious. Uh, so maybe we could talk a little bit about that in the... Uh, sometimes more harmonious. Some, sometimes more harmonious. Okay, very good. We'll talk about that maybe in a moment. So we've got um, a good uh, 25 minutes for discussion. The floor is open for your uh, questions. Uh, we could take a, take a few if there are and, uh, and then come back to the, to the panel. Uh, yes, here in the second row. There's a microphone, and um, and please introduce yourself for the uh, for the webcast. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Levine Manisha, and I'm here representing New Future Foundation, an organization working to empower the youth with leadership skills. But uh, I'm originally from Burundi, and. Uh, I would like to speak on the side of the civil society as a Burundian national. Mentioning the IDPs it was really alarming to my heart because it happens that uh, I am one of the IDPs. And I would like to thank the mayor by mentioning that it's a long-term problem. I have not heard about Burundi being mentioned as one of the countries facing IDPs problems. But uh, I just want to remind you that we have IDPs being there for more than 24 years, starting from 1993, and I was there. Up to now, these people are still internally displaced. And it is very hard, it is very hard for us when we are pushed to be internal refugees by 
the same, I mean, by our countrymen. And then having those same countrymen becoming leaders of tomorrow after the displacement. Our voices were shut down. Justice was never saved. And we still vulnerable of such arrangements. So my question or my comment is just, how are you going to make sure that these IEDPs in Burundi are not left out, having in mind that the current government has no political will to assist our IDPs. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. And uh, here, then also, and then we'll have uh, one more in the back. Can you hear me? Uh, my name is Ram Chalori, and I'm from Princeton, New Jersey, uh, with um, International Committee for Peace and Reconciliation. My question, and I don't really understand this myself, if you consider Syria, Afghanistan, and Yemen, the primary actors there are are fairly large uh, countries, including the US, Russia, Saudi Arabia. It looks to me that there is no effort by the UN to at least interfere and come up with a solution independent of these people who are bombing those countries left and right. So what is UN waiting for these things to happen and then come back and say, we have some more refugees, some more IDPs, and that we have to deal with them? Thank you. Here, I think maybe these two questions are, are related in some way. And what is the challenge when you don't have member state cooperation, I guess, is a, a good question. Uh, yes, here in the back, please. Hello, my name is Nasra Abubakar um, with the Sociology for Women in Society. And I originally come from Somalia. Uh, so my question is that the, um, there are people that you talked about earlier who uh, have been taken back, maybe from refugee camps, maybe some of them even from Europe or the United States. And uh, these people, how do they fit into the equation, uh, especially the people who are, um, the, especially the people who are even minorities within the the IDPs, uh, people who are vulnerable, like women, young uh, people, especially who need education. Even the ones who have gone to countries like my own country, Somalia, uh, where the, we have a government right now, but unfortunately the government does not control all sectors or all areas. And uh, do you have concrete uh, methods or mechanisms to reach those people? Also, uh, can you speak a little bit about how we can use research from uh, academics uh, from those areas who have originally been maybe displaced people themselves, and they are now researching uh, issues of displacement and immigration, uh, how you can use the, their skills and uh, information to bring solutions. Thank you. Great, thanks. We'll, we'll come back to the panel. We should have uh, time for one more, another round, so I know there's a couple more questions out there. Um, should we, uh, who would like to go first? Should we stop, start, uh, would you like to address any of the questions? Thank you very much. Let me start from the last question. I think that um, <clears throat> uh, the, unless the government has a political will to address the issue of uh, IDPs, like we did in Nigeria, we would, I'm afraid, if we can achieve sustainable development goals in those countries affected, mostly affected, especially Burundi and Somalia. Um, what we have before 2019 in Nigeria is refugee camps for, and mostly from Cameroon, inter-boundary Cameroon. We have not had serious internally displaced people until 2009, uh, which we believe that more or less uh, politically motivated or something like that. But when the government in power now came, he promised as a, uh, as a campaign um, strategy 
to say that when I'm elected, I am going to stop insurgency. And the, now immediately he was elected and sworn in, set up the uh, presidential initiative uh, committee headed by the Secretary of the Government of Nigeria to be in charge to come up with a, uh, a framework and a action plan on how we can stop insurgency and how you can assist those that are uh, affected by insurgency, how we can come up with a plan to resettle them in, and to give them a new life and hope that this future is bright for them. So there is a political will in Nigeria to deal with the situation. So it's a different ball game if there is no political will. There must be a leadership um, strategy. If the president of a country is interested and make sure that this thing must stop, and within six months, the rate of insurgency gone down by 70% within six months. And uh, he deliberately set up a victim support fund. Aside from the, the support from the national government, there's a fund, victim for support fund to, to settle them, to rebuild the uh, schools, to rebuild the hospitals, to rebuild the homes for those who are affected. They are having more new homes better than what they have before the insurgents now. So it's a long, I agree that's a long plan, long-term planning, because we can't, they cannot be done, it can, everything cannot be done within certain place. But as they, they come, we settle them down and give them a life. As we settle them down, we give them what to do. We impart life skill, we introduce agriculture, we introduce um, um, diff, uh, soft loan to them with a two-year moratorium to pay back. So, so they have a new life and they were happy. So aside from the intervention from the donor community, the UNDP, the national government, there's a fund, but everybody, if you have 10,000 Naira or $10,000, just put in the fund and everybody's willing to, 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 to donate. So we have that with the government led by the president is interested and he has promised and he's fulfilling the promise. So, the, pro the president of Burundi and Somalia must be interested in what is going on around there, if truly we want to achieve sustainable development. There must be a political will. Thank you very much for the questions. I'm not sure I'll be able to do any justice to them, I'm, uh, partly because I'm not entirely familiar with the details of Burundi, but I can assure you that OCHA has had uh, operations there for a very long time, as have other um, uh, UN uh, humanitarian agencies. Um, we have an office there right now, and IDPs is uh, central to, 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 to what we do. But I think the larger point is, um, the one that you also uh, pointed out, is the you require a partnership with a government to really make progress. Now, that partnership can be arrived at in very different ways. I mean, Nigeria just um, demonstrated how a country provides leadership um, and, and takes responsibility for some of its people. But we also have to recognize, and that's my, um, my problem, quite frankly, with a lot of the mainstreaming discussion. Of course, there is important and mainstreaming IDPs um, is into national development plans and so on is important in the sense that all these IDPs are human beings who also need to get the same services and and um, and goods at others. But they're also very specific. They have a status, and and the reasons for their displacement very often is 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 very specific. They are minorities. Um, uh, there's a political uh, underlying reason that actually prevents uh, uh, governments from from making their uh, the IDPs um, a central concern of, of theirs. So what I'm trying to say is in some places it may be easier to arrive at that partnership than it is in others. But we cannot come to a place and say, well, you know, until there is a political final solution, we'll sit here and provide humanitarian assistance. So we have to work towards those um, uh, plans uh, towards the sensitization, the, the cost in, in, in countries themselves, I mean, from that um, displacement. We, we see t partly radicalization of, of, of youth in, in camps and, uh, and, and other phenomena. Um, you have, I mean, in, in many places where entire regions, the youth um, 
has been uh, displaced and disconnected. There's a there's an entire generation of productivity that's 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 failing to contribute to the well-being of a country. So there is there is cost to the country itself in in denying um, um, a, a focus uh, to 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 those uh, to those people. Now in the among those, and I mentioned in, in my intervention earlier, that it's very important to look at the policies, I mean, what governments themselves can do beyond uh, fiscal matters. And budgets are one very obvious thing. But um, policies and laws have a, uh, a huge um, uh, impact. And in some places, we've seen this in the Balkans, and it's being repeated in, in parts of the Middle East again, mm. if you are displaced, and if you are displaced for multiple years, and then the government puts a law out or some uh, legal um, instrument that threatens to take your property away until, unless you come back in, in three months, which is totally inconceivable, destroyed cities, I mean, you know, the, 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 um, the, display, the reasons for the displacement uh, and, and continued uh, um, persecution, uh, possibly in some, some, some places, that is the opposite. Of, of conducive uh, 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 policies. So what I'm trying to say, maybe the word partnership is, is too much, but it must be our goal to achieve step by step understandings with the government um, around these groups of IDPs that they require more than just humanitarian assistance to create that space. If we don't do this, and we have some of the situations that were also mentioned around the table here. We've done some of those studies. You see that not only does the requirement for humanitarian assistance grow over five, uh, ten years exponentially, because in the beginning you provide food, water, shelter, and ten years down the road you provide sort of a, a, the, the basic services infrastructure um, on, a, on a humanitarian uh, budget. But it also at the same time leads to a total disincentivization of uh, uh, development ODA and of governments investing uh, into their own citizens. And so that's what, uh, what needs to, 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 to be changed. Um, so the, the focus of the humanitarians in Burundi or else is important. It's important to bring others in. But the bringing others in may not just be one event. It may be part of building that understanding and partnership with the government, which needs to be um, uh, going over years. And that is why it is important to look at IDP response as a multi-year, uh, multi as a longer-term response, not only as a short-term thing where we deliver our goods and then we're done until um, the, the, the next year. Last comment is just on women and youth. I think those are, and we have no way, we hear um, at, at the... Uh, um, for the Lake Chad Basin Conference, the, the first one in, in Oslo, but also the, the, for the London Conference on, on, on Syria. There were very specific, um, very specific uh, panels and solutions offered um, for education for uh, displaced uh, children, a specific focus um, on, on youth and, uh, and, and, and women. It's very clear that they need not only special programs, but, uh, but also very often where they, you have campsites, uh, special attention in terms of the configuration of those campsites. Maybe just because uh, you, you noted that you are from Somalia, um, uh, Bruno and I went there in, in December, and Somalia is one of those cases where we're actually applying this new way of working, whether we have identified a collective outcome to reduce the number of uh, displaced, and I think the displacement in Somalia is, is around 20 or 25% of the entire population, and as the, uh, the SRSG, the special representative of the sector general said, um, in many cities in, in Somalia, it's the, the, the fastest urbanization effort anywhere in the world because of that displacement. Um, so you do require those five-year horizons and you do require, in order to achieve solutions for those people, more than just providing humanitarian assistance. And that's why it's so important to have an outcome that guides both the humanitarian interventions as well as the um, uh, uh, developmental interventions and has um, the aid community on both sides of the, the uh, equation as well as the government uh, behind it. Thank you. Okay. Cecilia? No? Thank you very much for all the questions. And I think a lot has already been said, starting with the ambassador of Nigeria, who quite rightly um, pointed out about the importance of political will of the government 
and indeed there could be problems, there are problems, when you don't have the political will of a national government and or the local governments, the local sta or state levels that actually host IDPs. And in my work as a special rapporteur on the human rights of, I of uh, IDPs, it is uh, really um, an important and primary goal in the implementation of my mandate to insist that human rights should be the basis for all humanitarian and development um, approaches. And when we say human rights, that also means not only the humanitarian and development approaches, but also the accountability of the state. Because in the end of the day, what does a human rights framework mean? That is, the state is a duty bearer, and the IDPs are the rights holder. We must also, of course, uh, be very insistent that majority of the IDPs are actually nationals of the countries wherein they were uh, displaced. And, um, and it's really more of an exception that they are non-citizens or non-nationals. And this is why the political agency of the IDPs as nationals of the state have to be supported by both humanitarian and development actors in ensuring their capacity, resources, and their involvement to actually make solutions work for them rather than against them. Of course, this is, this is, this is all a very, very big um, goal to say. And this is why the implementation of the mandate that I carry right now, I'm, I'm really placing a lot of uh, emphasis on the right of IDPs to participate the IDP participation that I mentioned in my uh, presentation um, previously. But having said that, I also would like to insist and really emphasize the important role of civil society in making this political will on the part of the governments of the states a reality and not just insisting on IDP participation. I think it takes two to tango in that respect. One of the uh, priorities that I'm actually starting to give, um, which, is, which is very much linked to IDP participation, is not only the respect for the human rights of IDPs generally, but also their rights as nationals of the country. And that is, for example, in the right to electoral political participation, the right to vote. Because many IDPs are actually disenfranchised precisely because of their displacement. And, and this is one thing that I would like to invite actually in civil society to be very much um, uh, to to assist me in this regard. Because I think that without the right to political participation of IDPs, it will be very difficult to actually hold government to accountability and to have that political will. Uh, in the end of the day, of course, uh, and I think uh, Bruno Lemarchi also, uh, Lemarchi, uh, also emphasizes very much, and that is prevention. And prevention is not only within the country, but of course external. And again, at the international level, that means political will also on our part to insist on the right thing to do. Well, then maybe quickly on the on your question. I think at the top of the pyramid of all of that is 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 uh, uh, the primacy of politics, and the primacy of political solution, and the unity of the the, reg the region the international community, the unity in the Security Council. So this is it. In the absence of that, well, you move to the next step. And in that next step, there is a lot to do. Yeah. It's not the perfect, uh, but still, there is a lot to do. So in the Yemen, in the Syria, in the Afghanistan, uh, a lot of what we've discussed is being applied, uh, especially on, on uh, not treating uh, those, those uh, uh, displaced as a humanitarian caseload, but to have much more joined up approaches to give economic opportunities in Syria and, and the like, but it's not ideal. The ideal is to have uh, the primacy of, uh, of, uh, of politics. Yeah. And just to mention, one uh, in one of those three countries, uh, a recent and quite significant development on the in terms of the uh, the way the international architecture is working is in Yemen, with the the, the largest ever collaboration between the World Bank and the UN in terms of financing for early development, even in a context like Yemen, where the World Bank has put now close to $700 million through the UN to, uh, to do some of those interventions we've, we've talked about. So that's, that's, uh, that's quite significant. Thank you. 
Great, thank you. We have a few more minutes, and I know oh, I've got a bunch of hands up here. This, so uh, in the back here, the woman here who was up in the first round. Uh, yeah, the yellow, yeah, there you go. Right, yeah. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Um, I am from El Salvador and all of Central America. You know, we have been displaced since Columbus got lost. Hmm. We have wandered all up inside of our countries. Many of the problems that we are facing now is because it started then. So right now, for example, when we talk about displaced people inside, you know, people that have been forced to leave from the mountains, they ended up at the coast. And now because of, you know, ecotourism, they are being forced out of there also. And we don't know where they can go, and they are living by the sides of the, of the roads. But also, the big industry, sugarcane industry, you know, wants to sell more sugarcane. So they are taking the area of the mangroves. I think that, you know, like, more than asking a question, I want us to question how come we are here. You know, trying to develop a system by which no one is being left behind. But then I see what happened, for example, with Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rico archipelago and all the islands there, you know, even though some of them don't belong to the same country as Puerto Rico belong. And these people have been displaced even though they left from Puerto Rico to Boston and to Orlando, Florida. It's about a million of them. They cannot go back home because everything is being privatized and, you know, they want to have a place for startups. We need to discuss these things because, you know, these things are happening right in front of us. And citizens of the countries that benefit from these kinds of things have to pay, pay attention to this because that world that we are creating in the Caribbean is going to come back and hurt us because the hurricane season is coming back and it's going to be worse. They haven't been able to build. So, you know, I don't want to talk about philanthropy and humanitarian assistance. I want to talk about being human and humane. That's what, we, that's what the SDGs are about, and habitat and everything else. So please help me think about this, because I don't really understand how come we allow this to happen. Great, thank you. We're, we're just about out of time, but there's, I see there's a lot of eager. So if you don't mind, the panelists don't mind, I'd like to take a, just a few more questions, and then we'll come back for final, final comments. Yes, here. There, this, Gentlemen standing, both these two, five, two, three. yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can go next. You, you can go, go next. First, I'll go next. Well, you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Krishna Chakma, and uh, I'm representing the International Committee for Peace and Reconciliation and the CST Foundations. So, Mike, I have a question for uh, three agencies. Uh, UNDP and the UNH. Uh, uh, OCHA, and also the Special Reporter on Human Rights on, on, on this internally displaced people. So I was born in Bangladesh in Chittagong Hill Tracks. You know everybody about the Rohingya issue, who is fleeing from Myanmar to Bangladesh. We in Chittagong Hill Tracks has a more than three decades civil war between Bangladesh government and the Chakma or the Jumma people in Chittagong Hill Tracks. Jumma people represent actually the indigenous people, but Bangladesh government did not recognize so far. So when we, uh, the people that signed a peace accord in 1997, now 20 years passed, more than 60,000 refugees went to the India. According to the peace accord, government supposed to brought to the Bangladesh. Half of them brought, but they still, they don't have a place and government did not provide anything. All their places all grabbed by the settlers who be, uh, uh, brought from the outsider. So to the special reporter on IDPs, so I invite you to visit in this place in Chittagong Hill Tracks area. In 2011, a special reporter on indigenous issue, uh, Professor James and I are not able to visit in Chittagong Hill Tracks. Government did not allow him to visit. And the funny thing is, I, two months ago, I was in Cox's Bazar in Rohingya refugees camp. Government is inviting all over the NGOs and the ambassadors and the, all over the uh, dignitaries and the, the 
world leader to visit Rohingya camps. The funny thing is, Bangladesh military and government is not allowing to visit Chittagong Hill tracks internally displaced people, and you have to also get a special permission to enter this place. So that's my three question for the UNDP also, because a couple of years ago, UNDP want to move from Chittagong Hill tracks because of military intervention, they cannot do their work. So we appeal to the UNDP, please do not move. You are the only international office we have, the safeguard of these indigenous people. And the UNDP is doing well with us now, and we ask more things to do for the, these IDPs. And a special reporter, please visit the, our place. And also the Office of the Humanitarian, uh, uh, Mr. Shermayers, please include the IDPs in your report. Most of the time, we don't see the IDPs in Chittagong Hill track on your report. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Please, I want to I want to get a couple more voices, but please, if you can, just keep your questions very succinct. We're basically out of time, so just quick, sharp question, and then we're going to come back to the uh, to the panel for final remarks. Yes, sir. Hi, um, Oha Chamtov from the Parrot Party International. Um, on its uh, third session, the General Assembly accepted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And we would like to add another right to the Bill of Rights, which is uh, free access to the internet for every individual, every human being in the world. We believe that that would uh, promote peace and cooperation and would decrease the number of refugees in the world. And my question, if we succeed to get the UN accept that another right, uh, does the IPI have the ability to um, to implement such a thing, like to bring internet to every place in the world that doesn't have internet right now? Thank you. I, I love the fact that you actually think that we might be able to have that power. No, we are just a humble nonprofit uh, here. Uh, uh, but yeah, okay. Really quickly, all the way in the back, and then we're going to come here and here, and then the, the floor is closed, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Indai Sajor. I'm a senior IASC GenCap advisor and did work in many conflict countries. So I would just like to thank IPI for organizing this very important uh, discussion on the IDPs. Now, I think... Um, one of the things that I really learned from all of you who have just spoken is to look at the accountability of the government in relation to the long-term response that we need to do with the IDPs. And I think that's very important because that takes away the onus and the responsibility in a way uh, for long-term response to the government and not to the UN agencies. Because as what happens is you know, the responsibility goes to the UN all the time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, um, just to complete my question, is that we all know that when we work and deal with IDPs, whether it's in a conflict situation or natural disasters, we look at the different shift of gender roles during the flight and even when they are you know, in camps. And we also recognize that majority of the IDPs are women and children. Now, when we look at the accountability between um, humanitarian and development nexus, how do we make sure, and this is really my question, that we put the accountability to the government, how do we deal with them in ensuring that there is a gender responsive accountability to ensure that the development structure from humanitarian uh, to development is in place, you know, with the ministries Great. accountable you, for sir. that. Great, perfect. Okay, okay. 30 seconds. <laughs> yes. That's all I need. You're good. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, my name is Kevin, and I work, I'm an admin assistant at the Anti Defamation League, and we work on making inclusive communities here domestically in the US. And so, my question is related to social cohesion uh, as it relates to deep, uh, IDPs and host community. Uh, sorry, just reading my question. Um, so, I was, I wanted to ask, is, could you give any relevant 
uh, or concrete examples of relevant benchmarks and measures of success and challenges when it comes to social cohesion, just because social co cohesion is so closely related to political and in uh, economic inclusion that could lead to uh, reduced vulnerability. So thank you so much. Colleen from the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Thank you so much for hosting this event. My question very simply is, can you provide a little bit more information on some concrete examples you've taken with gender sensitive approaches within IDP camps from your experiences? Thank you. Great, thank you, thank you so much. I mean, we're, it's gonna be impossible to address all these really excellent questions. You know, the, the SDGs is about inclusion, so I didn't wanna leave anybody hanging here with their questions. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Um, but it, the best that you can, and we'll go in, in reverse order here, maybe starting with Bruno and down the line, in one minute, final remarks and answers to all these incredible questions. Bruno, the floor is yours. Well, I will only pick one. I will pass your message to the UNDP presence in the Chicago Hill tracks. Uh, we have been there since 2003, supporting social cohesion and the, all the post-peace agreement, uh, uh, all, all that uh, uh, you've described. So I'll pass the message. That's all I want to say. Thank you. OK. Um, let me just uh, start very quickly with Bangladesh. Actually, my predecessor, Professor Chaloka, had asked the government of Bangladesh, Is, are, are you still here? Oh there, oh, there you are. Had asked the government of Bangladesh to actually um, invite him. And I do intend to reiterate that request. So help us to do that, because we can't do it alone either. Um, El Salvador, as I mentioned in my, my presentation earlier, and I think, Senora, you weren't around yet, um, I made a visit to El Salvador. And in fact, not just social um, uh, criminal violence, but also <laughs> development projects um, actually are a cause of displacement. So I invite you to read the report that I presented to the UN Human Rights Council. There is some progress in El Salvador, but in my view, not enough. But they are willing to take steps forward, and I think we should support them in, in that case. And particularly, uh, we need for El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, a Northern Triangle um, approach, sub-regional approach, because without that, it will not really succeed if you're just looking at um, national level. Um, I will leave the rest of the questions on gender and cohesion, but maybe just to finish, um, I think that underlying all of these is really the guiding, the implementation of the guiding principles on internal displacement, which the Norwegian ambassador had mentioned. It's a 20th anniversary this year. So, um, and this, the plan of action from 2018 to 2022, which includes humanitarian development approaches have actually been endorsed by states, but also by the UNDP, UN High Commission for Refugees, OCHA, and IOM, and World Bank, et cetera. So this is a multi-stakeholder multi -stakeholder approach. And saying this, I, I just would like to emphasize, we cannot do this in silo from each other. We can really only do this in a collaborative, inclusive, um, spirit. So again, thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much. On the two programmatic questions, social cohesion and gender sensitive approaches, I mean, we can go on for a long time. I have one of my colleagues over here in the, I'm, I'm sure she's delighted right now, <laughs> in the white, <laughs> who can give you after this uh, a lot of examples. Um, on Myanmar and, uh, and Bangladesh, I feel very good because as we speak right now, I mean, um, if it had been different, you would have had the pleasure of seeing a, a much more uh, knowledgeable person here. But sh the reason that she's not here is she is in Myanmar right now um, because she's asked by the country team to, to work um, towards a, an integrated uh, IDP strategy to look exactly at, as the issue, at the issues that you, you noted. On uh, maybe just beyond the internet itself, I think it's the role of com communications in, in disaster and in, in humanitarian response. And we have a report um, that comes out annually. It's called the World Humanitarian Data and Trends Report. And we always have a small um, rubric there that actually shows the growing importance. So you have in many, many places, it's exactly, I mean, for example, the Philippines, um, a response a few years ago, uh, it shows that the internet and, uh, and, and telecommunications, to what extent they were actually used uh, to, uh, 
uh, to promote uh, uh, um, specific and inclusive uh, aid approaches. So for us, that is very uh, central to, 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 to what we're doing. Last point is on, on the question from our IAC, uh, from our uh, colleague uh, from, from GenCap. I mean, before we hold governments accountable, I would suggest we also hold ourselves accountable. And I think that's what we were all trying to say. There's a lot that the UN needs to do better before there's also a lot that governments need to do better. But what do we ask governments to be accountable for? So if we don't have solutions that we propose, that we say, here is a plan and this is how we go, this is what we did in other countries, this is what you can do, here is an outcome, we would like to work with you and this is why this outcome over five years is actually, if we don't promote these types of things, if we go to Colombia and simply hammer the government somewhere and say you need to do more, or we were in a, in a local community inundated for um, decades with, with um, IDP influx, um, if we just tell them you have to do more for these people, they will tell you get lost, you know, quite frankly, because they've been there for many years and there are budget issues, there are internal political tensions, there. accountability is a very complicated thing, that's what I'm saying. And the best thing is that we actually ourselves look at ourselves and, and say, how many times have we gone to Sudan or to some of these places and said, look, the next plan is going to be a five-year plan. And our ambition is, in certain areas, to actually reduce the number living in camps that when I went there the first time in 2003 and 4, had 10,000 people, and they now have 150,000 people, you know. Um, what are we doing to actually uh, stipulate or put out targets and, and, and objectives, uh, results for our own work, that make us uh, reduce um, the, the, the vulnerability and the need of people. And then, if we feel that there are certain things that are necessary from the government, and they are very often, in terms of policy changes, in terms of creating a more conducive environment, in terms of making impact, that's what you create an accountability um, or, or a, a discourse around, but not just with a more, uh, you're wrong and we are right, and, and that usually doesn't go anywhere. Your Excellency, last word. Thank you. Um, um, just to echo um, what has been said, uh, unfortunately, women and children are vulnerable in conflict and war. And I think that the women organization, NGO, and other must try as much as possible to reduce vulnerability. Because uh, to promote uh, peace, peace and um, reduce vulnerability, because it's coming back to us and our children. So, and as, as much as possible, I think goal five, goal 10, and goal 16 of SDG, uh, stand, uh, stand your long goals that addresses all these things. We have been given opportunity, and we must maximize the opportunity to ensure that it works for us. Women must at least ensure that they come together to ensure that they campaign about peace, they speak about peace, they love peace, and they uh, try to come together to uh, in form of advocacy and sensitization about peace so that we can have a place that we can come. There will be peace in the world and peace in our various uh, country. And then, then we'll be less vulnerable because everything comes back to us and our children. So we must promote Goal 5, Goal 10, Goal 16, which is peace justice and strong institution. I believe the political will must be there to have a strong institution that will reduce uh, crisis and conflict and they promote peace. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. That's a wonderful uh, note to, to close on. And just in conclusion, I would say, you know, th these questions were really excellent. I think it raised really the complexity and context specificity of these issues. Um, I think if there's a one general point that I take from this panel is that, of course, IDPs, it's not, uh, it's a long-term issue. It's not just a short-term humanitarian issue. It takes a whole system approach to find solutions, uh, and the SDGs provides the frame in order to, to accomplish that. Uh, and this, again, if we are to fulfill the pledge to leave no one behind, we have to address the issue of IDPs, and it must be concretely addressed. Uh, in our planning and in our activities, and we hope to do some more thinking and convening here at IPI around these issues, so please come back. Thank you again.